Welcome everyone to this webinar, Citizen Historians, Curating a Thousand Words. I'm Dr Penny Stannard and I'm Head of Curatorial at New South Wales State Archives and Sydney Living Museums. Before we get started, I'd like to firstly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country on which the Mint sits, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. For tonight's presentation, we'll be giving you a deeper insight into the curatorial approach to the exhibition, A Thousand Words, which is on at the Museum of Sydney and online. We're thrilled to be working with the History Council of New South Wales to present this talk as part of History Week 2020. The History Week theme is history, what's it good for? And throughout the talk, we're going to respond as how citizens really have a role to play in creating the value in historical archives and how you can contribute. We'll also be able to answer some of your questions at the end of the presentation. So please use the live chat function that you'll see on your screen to ask your question throughout the talk and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Nerida Campbell one of the Sydney Living Museum curators, and many of you will know Nerida. It's been my privilege to work with Nerida as the co-curator for A Thousand Words. Welcome to you, Nerida. Thank you, Penny. I'd like to introduce you to the concept of A Thousand Words. As I mentioned before, the question being posed in History Week is, history, what's it good for? If you're tuning in tonight, then you will already have formed some answers to this question. You probably have a lot of things to say about it. Tonight's talk, Curating History, Citizen Historians Curating a Thousand Words, we're going to take you through a really exciting exhibition project that has involved 30,000 public contributions made to the curatorial content and over 1.4 million social media engagements and 188,000 web page views since May. I've got a history, you've got a history, we've all got a history. And all of us, if given the chance, have something to say about history. What would happen if this idea was coupled with the popular saying, a picture tells a thousand words? What would a picture, a photographic image from the past, say about me? What would it say about you? And what would happen if we shared these perspectives? How do photographic images from the past trigger memories or emotions? How do they help us recall in our memories a place or event or a person that we'd long forgotten? Would an image from the past connect with something in the present? And how do images from the past help us to imagine the future? How do different people read the same image? And can one image be read in multiple ways by the one person? If it's said that a picture can tell a thousand words, then I wanted to put it to the test and the exhibition project, A Thousand Words, and has enabled this to happen. Initially conceived as an online exhibition, A Thousand Words has grown to become a physical exhibition as well. Both the online and the physical exhibitions are now available for you to view in person at the museum or online at atwonline.com.au. A Thousand Words presents 100 of the most compelling photographic images sourced from the State Archives and Sydney Living Museum's collections. But they've been presented without any traditional museum interpretation. Instead, we've invited the public to join us as co-curators to interpret what an image means to them through the lens of their own life experience, knowledge, values and attitudes. It's a way of deinstitutionalizing the archive and asking non-official voices, also known as the public, to come with us and make meaning of these historical images, which we are the custodians of. It's a process of cultural democracy where everyone can have their say in how history is understood. Not only historians, not curators, and not only researchers, but everyone has something to say. And there, what they say is valid. And in this day and age, both the official voice and the non-official voice work hand in glove. The concepts behind A Thousand Words not only borrow from the tenets of cultural democracy and public history, but also from 
investment theory. And this might be something that you might be surprised to hear. So how did Nerida and I, assisted by a fabulous team of project managers, designers, web developers and marketers, put these lofty ideals into practice and work within the timeframes and the resources that we as curators in public institutions operate to? Well, firstly, the maths. 1,000 words, 100 images, one word. Secondly, the science. We borrowed from the principles of the citizen science movement, where the public is invited through platforms that are familiar to them to contribute to the generating of new knowledge. And then we aggregate that knowledge and create new understandings about things, about people, about places, and in this case, about our photographic collections. Thirdly, the English. The citizen contributions were published and distributed through the platforms of Facebook, social media and Twitter. Next, the campaign. To put the call out inviting one word responses, we rolled out a campaign called hashtag one word Wednesday in October 2019. Over a 10 month period, we kicked it off as it's one word Wednesday. We're asking you for a one word response to an image from the archives. Contribute to our online exhibition, A Thousand Words. Note, this is where investment theory comes into the story. Invest your one word and you can be part, you can have a stake in something bigger for the future. After two incredibly successful months with One Word Wednesday, we launched Say It on Saturday. And this gave contributors the opportunity to respond not just with one word, but with longer form content. And we were really surprised by how many creative writers there are out there. It was a wonderful experience. Lastly, the art. What we've done is we've scraped all of those one word contributions from the social media platform and aggregated those and republished them as visual word clouds or visual graphics. And together, this shows the range and frequency of words that people contributed. The more frequently a word was contributed, the larger it appears in the word cloud, if you like. And this combination of image and all of the words that were lodged to describe it creates our exhibition content. And the art again. In addition to sourcing public contributions, we also commissioned imagined or creative contributions from 17 wonderful established and emerging artists who, worked with, who work with text and writing. Fact or fiction. Some people want to know right up front what an image is actually about. And we offer this in the exhibition where people can go to a place in the exhibition, both online and at the physical exhibition and find the institution's detail or the institution's story about the image. But it's actually been through the process of sourcing public contributions that we found out a lot more about these images in our collection than we previously knew. Nerida and I are going to discuss tonight a small number of images from this incredible exhibition and this incredible collection of 100 images. I'm going to cover the public and the artist's interpretation of the images, and Nerida is going to cover the institution and the historian's perspective. The first image I'd like to talk about is from the State Archives collection. When I first viewed this photograph in the State Archives collection, I knew that it had to be in the exhibition. I could see immediately that this image captured the zeitgeist of a very popular television series that was currently on or recently on. It had more than 300 one word contributions and counting. The most frequent words were handmaid, calisthenetics, stretch, Gilead and punishment. Other words included despair, Unison, control, sisterhood, surrender, and my favorite, YMCA. Typically the responses range from what we call the sentiment or emotive responses to the more descriptive responses. We had a wonderful artist response from Eunice Andrada, a young Filipina poet based in Western Sydney. Her piece, Become, Error, engages with the image through the idea of the male gaze, 
surveillance and the power that institutions hold over women's lives. She draws attention to the trousered figure in the far left with arms held downwards, who keeps watch over the faceless, uniformly dressed women upon whose backs numbers are printed. The women are anonymised, their identities erased. You've seen the public and the artist's response. Now, what's the institution's information about this image? Well, Penny, I'm a history geek. And when I look at images, I like to know what's happening, why it's happening, and what the context is around it. So this image was one that really excited me. Um, it's, an um, it's an undated image of women exercising in the State Reformatory for Women, which was opened in 1909 at Long Bay. Um, feminists, including the luminary Rose Scott, had campaigned really hard to have a purpose-built prison um, here in New South Wales for female prisoners. Um, philosophically, it was a little bit different. It was known as a reformatory, so it very much had this idea behind it that women could be reformed during their time in the prison and come out as model citizens, as opposed to the men's um, prison, which was known as the penitentiary. It was a place of much more punishment. Um, I think the differences in that philosophy can really be encapsulated in a very simple thing that happened within the prison. The women were encouraged to grow flowers and to contemplate nature and the beauty of nature, whereas the men were encouraged to grow cabbages because they were cheap and nourishing. So, you know, very different philosophies um, encapsulated there. The image is really interesting to unpack. Now you can see if you look and zoom in really carefully that on some of the women's um, caps you have an A and this indicates that these were women from A wing. Now at this time there was also a great concern about prisoners mingling who were you know mingling the hardened prisoners with the newbies and so they developed this series of different gradings for prisoners and the women who were in the A wing tended to be the younger prisoners they were um, people who had less extensive criminal um, careers and it was hoped that they would only go to prison once they'd learn their lesson and not come back and that's what we're seeing here some of the women from a wing you mentioned the sinister mysterious figure on the left of the image their face is shaded um, I find that a really interesting figure too part of the philosophy of prison um, for women at this time was to have female warders as opposed to male warders as much as was possible and I wonder if this figure in the corner is actually a woman, not a man. Now, we can see that they're dressed wearing pants and we know that female warders were issued with, um, with dresses, but this person's got um, a waist cinching belt on. They've got a large collar, a white collar on, which is quite a feminine looking piece of um, costume. And I suspect that it might actually be a woman, not, not a man there in, in the corner. Um, what are the women doing? Well, they're doing what was known as Swedish exercises. Now, one of the deputy controllers of the prison just loved this concept of Swedish exercises. They were body weight exercises. And the idea was that um, they would provide the women with um, flexibility and strength and that, you know, it would also lead to a more docile prison population because they'd gotten, you know, a bit of exercise first thing in the morning. One of the regulations was after they did exercise first thing in the morning, they had to have a cold shower. And as someone who has visited this part of the Long Bay prison, I can say that I don't envy them in winter. It is absolutely freezing um, to, to have to spend time out there is... Um, you know, after a cold shower would be particularly unpleasant. Back to you. Great. Thanks, Nerida. Fascinating insight from uh, Nerida Campbell there. The next image is quite different. It uh, shows a dog gazing into a crystal ball. And this image is from the Sydney Living Museum's collection. Completely different to the previous image, which was dark foreboding. This one is delightful, imaginative and playful. And it's been a real crowd favourite. It's had more than 250 public contributions to date. The most frequent one words contributed include future, reflection, gypsy, and curious. Others include clairvoyant, playtime, soothsayer, and hopeful. My favorites are watchdog, houndsight, wishbone and ball, and poor fiction. 
You've seen the public response. Let's turn to Nerida again for the institution's story about this image. Well, this image um, is a remarkably um, beautiful photograph, quite whimsical. And I suppose having it in the exhibition encouraged us to have another look at our collections, and in particular, this collection of photographs that was taken by a man called Alan Evans. So Manor was the beloved pet of Alan and his wife, Sylvia Evans. They lived in Arncliff. He was a stray, he was taken in by the couple, and they named him Manna because he was like manna from heaven for them. So um, very much valued um, family pet. Alan Evans took lots of photos of Manna, including this one of um, Manna reading the crystal ball, but also um, images of him you know, on the telephone and you know, staring out windows and running around in the backyard and having a good time. Sylvia Evans actually enjoyed writing and she wrote a book about Manor. It was a children's book which was published in 1944 um, called Tail Up. And uh, it, it purported to be the dog's story told from Manor's point of view. And it included um, Manor's arch nemesis, Blackie, the uh, neighbourhood dog, and also many of um, Manor's friends also got a Guernsey in, in that. Um. So photography was one of Alan Evans's passions and he regularly photographed not just Manor, but his home, his workplace, he worked for Davis Gelatine out at Botany, um, and he shared these images with magazines and newspaper publishers. So Manor appeared you know, in newspapers reasonably regularly. Um, one series is really one series of images I found really interesting because it sort of reminded me of something that was um, part of the wartime experience here, so the Second World War here in Sydney. And one of these sort of little byways that um, I hadn't come across before I researched this image was this idea that if the war did come to Australia, pets might be um, discombobulated by the sounds of bombs and the rest, and they might become vicious and actually attack their owners. So what Manor's owner did was um, Sylvia created a helmet that had cotton wool to protect Manor's ears and a muzzle made out of um, leather that went over her nose. And this, pictures of this were actually published as an example of how you might deal with a dog in wartime if there was loud noises and it became frightened. So that was an interesting thing that I'd never come across before, nor had I ever thought of before. Um, Mana also developed a regular group of correspondents. So other people who would write stories to the Evans family pretending that it was coming from their dogs. And when Mana um, met her untimely death in 1946, they sent condolence cards to Mana. Um, and as part of the process of working on the exhibition, we discovered this image. And this is actually the behind the scenes photograph um, taken of Mana being set up with the crystal ball in front of her and with Sylvia Evans there in the background holding Manor still. So on to our next Thanks, selection. Thanks, Nerida. Well, if Manor was around today, Manor would be a meme. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful story about a, an ordinary looking dog. The next image I'd like to talk about is this one, RRR Refreshments. This one's also from the State Archives collection. And this one was published through the Say It On Saturday campaign, where contributors could respond with one word or a longer form comment. And tonight, I'd like to share some of the longer form comments with you. You can see the multitude of one words that were lodged with the campaign or with the image. But let me read to you some of my favourite longer form responses that contributors made to this image. Many contributors immediately recognised this as being Granville train station in Western Sydney. Here's the first one. The second I saw this photo, I said to myself, that's Granville. Many late nights spent waiting on that platform. Another. Mum with my sister and I changed trains here for Marylands back in the 60s. And as a treat, we could have a meat pie. They were the best pies around. Another, as young employees working in the city and living on the outskirts of Sydney, we tried to outsmart the transport system by catching the fast train from the city to Granville, then exchange here to catch the fast train home. Granville Station, I know of a few couples that met here and later married. 
Some are still married. A bit like a dating app to meet people, but in real time with a refreshment. For some contributors, the image triggered memories of the tragic Granville train disaster in 1977. And here's one of those. Maccas and the salvos feeding the workers and injured when the bridge collapsed. There were also some delightful imagined interpretations of this image. Let me share some of those with you. In retrospect, I was so glad the train was running late, allowing me to buy a coffee and then you'll never guess who walked in. A young man from the future checking out his phone in 1962, older lady watching him and wondering what on earth he's doing. Few people understand the TARDIS and portal-like qualities of the Spock and Span RRR. One foot inside and a new world was revealed. Time stood still and your one track mind was transformed. You've seen and heard some of the public responses. Nerida, what's the institution and the historian's story about this image? Well, the first railway refreshment rooms were leased to private vendors and they served railway stations in Sydney and in some regional areas, Mount Victoria, Mittagong, Penrith also had these railway refreshment rooms and they were designed to provide food, drink and other small necessities for travellers and they were supposed to be cheap and fast. That was part of what they were designed to um, provide to the travelling public. They morphed with the times, um, moving from the provision of seated meals through, you know, to milkshakes, takeaway foods, and eventually when trains were able to travel longer distances without having to stop many of these RRRs disappeared. Uh, they, so their goal was to provide this cheap, fast food for travellers, and that was not always achieved. Newspapers of the period have complaint after complaint about the food not being good or there not being enough time left um, on the train timetable for you to actually eat your food before you had to move on to the next stage of your journey. There are also complaints about the pricing of some of the foods that were available at the Triple R's. In 1901, a politician even complained to the Premier about the quality of food at Triple R's. Um, and clearly it was a slow process to, to bring them into line with public expectations because in 1920, another politician was complaining that the sandwiches they served tasted like seaweed. So they weren't terribly popular with everyone. The menus did change with time. So the earlier menus, you know, they were very focused on things like porridge and soup. And later we hear, you know, that sandwiches and pies have become much more the norm at these places. In 1921, it was reported that 3 million people eight at a triple R in that previous year. So they were incredibly popular. Tables were provided, but there were often complaints of what were called counter huggers. And they claimed them that they were mostly women eating their Devonshire teas at the counter instead of going to a table. And it most, you know, it was most inconvenient to other travelers. They sold confectionery and fruit, cigarettes and alcohol. And that was a little bit of a a little bit of a sticking point with some members of the public who wondered about them selling alcohol. But there were also occasions where leasees had been charged by the police for providing alcohol or cigarettes on the Sabbath, on a Sunday. Um, and it was it went through courts and you know, a proclamation basically came down to say that it was OK for them to serve these things because they were necessities for travellers and only bona fide travellers could actually buy alcohol or cigarettes on a Sunday. We do hear stories in regional New South Wales of lots of locals appearing on platforms on a Sunday, uh, intending to catch a train, but perhaps just there to have a drink. Architecturally too, some of them are really interesting. This is a beautiful shot, this round building with the gorgeous um, windows allowing light to come in. It really invites you to sit and linger over your coffee and indeed, in 1936, the RRR at Wynyard Station was commended in the building journal, who said that it was modernism in architecture as it should be. So some of them were quite architecturally forward um, and they really were quite inviting spaces for people to spend their time. Let's move on to our next image. Drudgery. This is one of my favourite, favourite images um, from the State Archives and Records collection. Uh, we've got the man there standing next to his bus, 
Spanish drudgery with electricity. This image has been really popular with people visiting the Museum of Sydney to see the exhibition. We have a selection of the images. We don't have all 100, but we've got some of the really popular ones that the public have loved and responded to, and this is one of them. And the public can leave their responses at the museum. And this is one of uh, the humorous ones that one of our um, patrons left tired of the remorseless campaign against him, the latest being threatened with electrocution, Bill Drudgery packed his bags and left town. We've also found that many members of the public have chosen not to use words, but to pick up a pen and draw their response. And this is a fantastic one um, drawn by one of our visitors responding to this image of a man in a gas mask. Returning to the question, history, what's it good for? I'd like to ask the question, what's a thousand words being good for? Well, for us as curators, a thousand words been fantastic for lots of things. It's allowed us to apply innovative curatorial methodologies that enable new knowledge generation about and awareness of our collections. It's enabled us to bring diverse voices into the interpretation of primary historical material. It's challenged our assumptions of how primary source material can be interpreted and understood. It's placed audience development at the conceptual point of a project's curatorial and conceptual vision, not as something that comes into play afterwards. It's allowed us to develop a community of interest throughout the project's development, where individuals and a collective of individuals have made an incredible investment in its success. And it's allowed us to integrate public engagement as a curatorial methodology. What's a thousand words been good for, for the institutions that we represent? Well, it's deepened the level and extended the reach of audience engagement in public collections. And it's made collections more accessible and navigable. And what's a thousand words been good for, for the public? Well, it's enabled them to contribute towards history and having their contribution valued. It's enabled people to tell their story, to share memories and perspectives, to be part of something bigger, to exercise the brain cells. One word is more difficult than it might first seem. It's allowed people to imagine. And I'd like to share a comment from one of our contributors who made her comment towards the end of the One Word Wednesday campaign period. And she wrote, can I just say, I am really enjoying seeing the images, reading the comments and using my brain to come up with a creative and insightful word each time. It is an amazing project and really interesting. Everyone has a different perspective. Thank you to the organisers and to the State Archives for sharing and keeping us all intrigued. It is the perfect time this has come about. Thank you. We'd love now to answer some of your questions that you've been sending through. If you haven't already, feel free to use the chat function on your screen to type any questions you have about the exhibition and we'll get to as many of these as we can. Oh, oh Penny, we've got our first question. Oh. <laughs> um, and it is, what makes a good picture from a curator's point of view? Well, that's a very good question. What makes a good picture from a curator's point of view? I might start answering that one and then hand over to you, Nerida, as co-curator. For me, a good picture, or what makes a good picture, is a picture that is compelling. A picture that draws you in, draws your curiosity in, and allows you to wonder what on earth is going on here. But a picture, a good picture is also a picture that is, has a wonderful sense of composition and a sense of artistry about it. And many of the images that I chose to feature in the exhibition are incredibly fine photographic artworks. And so for me, those elements are some of the elements that come into making a good picture. What about you, Nerida? 
I also like a picture that is aesthetically pleasing, but I'm often wanting to know the story behind the picture. So I like, uh, I like to um, find pictures that lead me off into a field of research. Um, so some of the images in the exhibition that had some unexpected fields of research for me um, included one of four women um, standing in beautiful 1950s dresses. And you can find this on our website, um, AETW. Um, and they look gorgeous. And most of the members of the public comment on the fact that they look elegant and they look so refined and they look like they're three or four women going out to have a, a good time together. But in fact, they're four members of the New South Wales Police and they're dressed up because they're going to a garden party in government, the grounds of Government House here in Sydney in 1954. And their role is to protect the Queen. They've got these gorgeous handbags with them, but the handbags had to be big because they had to carry battens in case they were called upon to protect, to protect the Queen. So I love the fashion and I love how they look, but I also really enjoy the backstory of that and what you can learn about women, women's role in the police and a really unexpected element to the story. Yes, it's the unexpected and sometimes the, um, the paradox of uh, the story behind the image that can um, really uh, cause a wonderful um, range of interpretations and understandings, I suppose. Yes. So the next question that's come through is, how long did it take to go through all of the responses? And there were a lot. <laughs> Well, that's a very good question. How long did it take to go through all of the responses? Well, this is where we had some wonderful people um, working with us. So we had um, the campaigns online for about nine months um, and each week as an image was published, um, we had our colleagues at the other end who were going through those comments, taking those comments, um, what we might, the language you use, we use is scraping those comments um, out of the social it's media nice platforms <laughs> <laughs> and then um, entering that data, if you like, into a particular system, which then allowed us to um, publish the word cloud. So um, look, it could take, uh, probably I'd say, um, it, it, depending on how many comments there were and depending on how many times an image was shared, it could be a good day's worth um, of actually going through, tracking down what the comments were, where they were shared, and then um, you know, doing that process of um, data scraping. Excellent. Well, the next, the next question I might throw to you too, to begin with, what sources did you use to find the backstories to these images? Another really great question. Um, I'll answer it from the State Archives perspective and then hand over to you, Nerida. So many of the State Archives images have very little information about them. The State Archives has over 14 million items in its collection. And the way that um, the collection is catalogued, it's, if you like, catalogued in bulk. And so going into the specific details in many cases of a photograph, that information just isn't there. So what we had to do was to often refer to newspapers of the time. We, if we could find a date of an image or a year of an image, reference to an event or a place, that then allowed us to go uh, into um, repositories like Trove and then to start to find newspaper reports and to start to flesh out some of that story. So that was probably the first port of call in many of the cases in relation to images from the State Archives collection. What about images from the City Living Museum's collections? Again, we used a lot of newspaper reports, but also um, published documents from government sources. So annual reports on you know, websites like OpenGov are really important to the types of research that I do into objects and images, but also the public. Um, some of the images in the Sydney Living Museum's collection, um, people have come forward and given us some details um, of who they think is in that picture or they might themselves be, be in that picture. And that helps us to find out a little bit more. We also have an oral history collection and some of the oral histories that have been done. So for instance, um, on police women, actually um, name the people in, in the photographs and give us a little bit more of a context as to why that image was taken. So we do use a variety of sources and um, the public play a really important role in refining our knowledge of these, of these um, photographs. So um, that's always something that's a delight, that two-way conversation. And do you think, Nerida, that 
the, um, the process or the methodology that we've used for a thousand words has enabled us to really grow um, our knowledge about aspects of what an image might be um, documenting or featuring that we just didn't know about or you know wouldn't have couldn't have known about yeah absolutely um, so one of the images that we put out was one um, relating to an accident that had happened a car crash and members of the public could actually come back to us and say I know exactly where that took place and have actually been able to give us a suburb so that we can better understand what happened and do better research into what the what the circumstances were around that image being taken by police. Okay, we've got our next question. Um, is there really a division between the public and the curator? Another wonderful question. We need both voices. Um, we, we are the custodians or we, we work for organisations that are the custodians of collections that belong to the people of New South Wales in the cases of both of our institutions. And a lot of the um, information that we have about um, objects and items in our collection come through official sources. So the information that we get is framed in a particular way, Fla in, the state of the, in the case of the State Archives, framed in government speak, framed in terms of government agendas and government policies of the time. So that's what we um, often, that's our starting point often as curators. And what the public uh, perspectives can contribute to um, curators' knowledge I describe it as kind of the, the humanising of the official or the, the, the sort of official information or the official descriptions. And so there is a, I think, a, a difference. Um, the dream for us, and we've been allowed to do this in many cases, is to align the two. And earlier in my introduction, I talked about that in this day and age, for history to have contemporary relevance and to really mean something to everybody, it's that bringing together of the official or authorised voice and the non-authorised voice, the personal, the human. So there are differences, um, but when they coalesce, it is an incredible uh, story that can be told. Uh, what about you, Nerida? I don't actually believe that there's such a division between the public and the curator. We're not sitting in our ivory towers. Every day we're talking to people and hearing their stories. Um, the public is incredibly sophisticated and they, they have um, many things that they can share with us and teach us about the collections that we look after. And we don't own these collections. As you say, these are public collections and the stories um, that the public share with us and the stories that are related to the objects in our collection, that's what makes them significant and valuable. And having those conversations and building our knowledge and building you know, a sense of why is this object important? Why does the public think this object's important? How can I share these stories? Um, that you know, it sort of a, becomes a two-way conversation, and I think that that's that's part of the curatorial practice today. We're not necessarily standing up as experts; we're standing up as people who um, are able to share stories with um, with all of the public, and to hear those stories is one of the great parts of my job. I, I think you know, when people are generous enough to share stories about their families and about their history, that's incredible. Now we have um, a longer question here. It says, a lot of museums have been engaging in rapid response collecting, to borrow a term from the VNA in London, because of COVID. What sort of exhibitions do you think people will be making in a hundred years from now, using photographs from this point in time? And then in brackets it says, totally speculative, I know. <laughs> Just think it's interesting to think about. Do you want to have a go at that one? Great question. Thanks. It, it's quite interesting to, to think about how we would actually frame COVID um, going forward in 100 years. Uh, as part of this exhibition, we've had a look at the 1919 um, flu pandemic and how that was captured in documents and in photographs. I think um, today, because of technology, we 
are going to have a plurality of voices that we can draw on to tell stories. When um, I'd been looking at the 1919 pandemic, it was often about government sources, maybe a few people's diaries or letters, a little bit of the newspaper reporting and the photographs. But today we've got people who are doing TikTok dances about how to wash your hands. Um, they're taking photographs, they're keeping diaries online, they're sharing information in a way that just didn't happen a um, hundred years ago. And I think that will make for a much more vibrant and much more inclusive form of storytelling. Um, internationally, we're also hearing about the experiences of people in other countries. And I think that any, any way of telling, you know, the story of this current period will involve those international perspectives and a lot more vision, a lot more um, film and a lot more taken from the online environment, as opposed to the documents and photographs that we've relied on to tell the stories of 100 years ago and that pandemic. Do you have something you want well, to you've add? Well, you've raised an interesting issue there around um, records that are born digital. So whereas when we've been looking at images um, for this exhibition from the past and, and the records around those image, images, a lot of them are in um, formats that have a material form, if you like. We're now in, a, in an era where um, many records, um, including photographs, are born digital. And some of the risks associated with born digital records going forward are around um, not knowing in 10, 20, 30, 100 years what our, uh, how technology might have changed and whether or not um, photographic images and other records that are born digital actually become, uh, are at risk of obsolescence, I suppose. Um, in terms of how individuals and institutions um, sort of catalogue and manage those kind of collections, um, it's a constantly evolving um, situation. And so I think one of the things we need to consider when we think about what the landscape might be in 100 years in terms of exhibitions, it's taking into account that fast moving change that is happening um, and will continue to happen and possibly accelerate in terms of the kind of formats that um, uh, we, um, we are sort of using today and, and how they might, um, you know, what the situation might be in a hundred years from now in terms of revisiting or engaging with those formats. Um, and there's some incredible people working on um, certainly um, that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's an interesting um, question to sort of come out of, of the, um, the question that um, was posed from a, a member of the audience. Yeah, I, I think also um, the way that people have responded to COVID crosses the age barriers. Often when we're looking at historical documents, teenagers in particular haven't really written much, haven't really had much of a say. But today with you know the, the online savvy teenagers, um, I think we're going to be able to get responses from a range of different voices across different ages, which I don't think was possible 100 years ago. And so I think our exhibitions are going to look very, very different in mm. another 100 years. I've got another question um, about, uh, it says, this was quite an experimental approach to curation. Do you have more experiments planned for the future? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Um, we're always thinking about innovative ways of engaging audiences, not just our existing audiences, but new audiences in the work that we do through both of the institutions um, that have been involved in this project. And um, for many people, uh, this particular curatorial methodology for a thousand words was quite different. Yes. Um, it was one that um, was theoretical, I suppose, to start with. Um, so we did uh, take a uh, risk in terms of once we put the theory into practice um, to find out whether or not it would work. Um, and I was absolutely delighted with the first one day Wednesday, uh, one word Wednesday post um, immediately. Uh, I think within the first hour, there were more than a hundred uh, one word responses. And it was so successful that uh, a number of other um, Australian and international institutions actually copied <laughs> the campaign. So we're always um, uh, putting our, uh, our minds towards uh, different innovative approaches. But at the end of the day, it's about opening up these collections. It's opening up the collections to the public who, who own these collections. And it's about building that public value in the collections and the work that these institutions do. 
And we're also always really open to ideas that people might have um, about the kinds of things that um, they would suggest would help us um, in achieving that. So um, we've got a number of things on the burner at the moment. Um, stay tuned, um, but I'll hand over to Nerida because she could um, also uh, give a perspective on that. Yeah, I suppose one of the things that at Sydney Living Museums we are constantly trying to be is bold, to take new ideas, to engage with the public and to find different ways um, of satisfying the, the public's curiosity in ways that might be a little bit delightful, a little bit whimsical, a little bit different, um, but it's certainly something that we're always trying to do. You know, we don't we don't want to bore people. That's not our job as curators. We want to excite people, engage people. Um, so we're always looking for new ways to do that. Now, the next question is, what's been your favourite part of the process of creating this exhibition? Should I answer that one first? Sure. My favourite part of the process um, has been the contributions by the public and has uh, each uh, Wednesday and each Saturday as a post went out and seeing how people have really taken up the call to contribute their responses. The, um, the fact that more than 30,000 responses were contributed, um, it certainly exceeded my expectations. And for me, just uh, seeing the level of engagement, the level of um, commitment that people had and the kind of feedback that they were giving us in terms of um, being able to contribute to this, um, making it and having their contribution valued and being part of something bigger became even more important and more poignant during COVID-19. This exhibition project uh, was evolving for probably about um, 18 months before we launched the One Word Wednesday campaign. So the thinking around it was not pinned to a COVID-19 type situation, yes. but the thinking around it was that we do need to, as institutions, move into the online space in different ways. And we do, do need to find ways where we can open up conversations, where we can bring people in as partners, as co-curators in this case, to make meaning of our collections. It was serendipitous or coincidental, if you like, that um, the exhibition was ready to be launched um, at the time of COVID-19. And many, many people fed back to us that during the period of lockdown where people were feeling sort of more isolated and perhaps disengaged from their usual um, activities, that being able to contribute to um, One Word Wednesday or say it on Saturday and seeing what other people were contributing and being part of a community, a community that formed online around these incredible images, was incredibly meaningful to them and gave them something to look forward to each each week. And that is absolutely the kind of feedback that we've got. So for me, it's been um, an incredible joy and uh, to see that um, the, the level of um, participation um, that people have had and also what we've been able to learn from people. Certainly some of my assumptions um, that I had about some of the material were really challenged. Uh, images that I selected for the exhibition through a particular lens, others viewed it through a completely different lens and um, in some ways, you know, and, and, and provoked us to, um, to think differently. And I think as curators, um, we, we thrive on that kind of thing. We want those diverse perspectives and the online space allows that to happen. So for me, it's just been a wonderful um, form of community and audience engagement and um, uh, something that we certainly um, are building on and we can talk about that a little bit later. What about for you, Nerida? What's been the most um, satisfying or enjoyable part? It's brought me great joy too to have the public responding to these images and owning them and giving them new meanings. But I've also enjoyed the work that's been done by the Commission Creatives and in particular the young people who are working with Westward. So they're, they're young and emerging writers and the responses that they've had to the images have been really thought provoking. For me, I tend to look at them more from a historian's point of view. What's going on here? Why was this photo taken? Um, but they've come in with all of these other layers of interpretation that really make, have made me look at the image in a very, very different way beyond aesthetics, beyond the history and into a, a newly sort of creative realm, I suppose. So that has been a real pleasure. So the next question um, is, what new insights 
has the exhibition brought to your understanding of images in the SLM and State Archives collections? I'll have a go at answering that one first. Um, it's brought a lot of uh, new insights generally. Um, there have been some specific images where um, the public contributions have uh, allowed me to have a kind of a more nuanced insight, I suppose. And I might use a, an image as an example. It's not one that we've um, put on the slideshow tonight, but you'll be able to see it if you go onto the um, online exhibition ATW online.com.au and it's an image that features two men atop an electricity power pole and it's an image that um, when I, again when I first saw it um, in the State Archives collection it was so compelling it was um, there was a real drama playing out um, it's a very fine um, finely, finely composed photograph um, it is um, you know what, what's going on and there was very little information about it apart that apart from the fact that it comes from the Osgrid collection uh, formerly known as the Sydney County Council um, and this one my sort of um, reading of it was a situation where there's a there's a, there's a pair of men in an embrace um, are they lovers are they mates are they they're dancing a duo what are they doing up there on this power pole it's a very powerful image and the, the power pole itself sort of stands like a sort of crucifix um, behind them and the, and the grey skies are raging overhead. And we, we published that image and it had a, an incredible number of responses and um, with very little information, as I said, on the catalogue, um, what we were able to find out through the public responses and the way that the responses uh, interacted in conversation was that in fact what the image was, was a training exercise undertaken by electricity workers as part of their regular training around resuscitation. Um, and so if a, a, a worker was um, electrocuted or became unconscious at the top of a power pole, that their mate knew, had to know how to step in and resuscitate that person. And what we also found out was that um, this image was showing uh, two men rather than a man and a dummy or a model. Um, and we found out that um, they used uh, their colleagues for the training, if you like, um, when there were no dummies available. And, um, and so it, it was a staged image and um, it was very much part of this regular training exercise. And so that sort of information that came back from us and people actually putting themselves in that context um, where they might have been a, a worker for the Sydney County Council, they might have experienced that training, really allowed us to go from a situation where we had very little information and very little insight to having a, a, you know, quite a significant amount of insight. And that will allow us now to go down the path further in terms of not that, just that image, but many other images that exist in that particular collection. So that's one example where um, sort of the insight was minimal and the contributions have allowed a, a much, much greater and informative insight to be formed. What about you, Nerida? I found um, that the images that I expected the public would respond most strongly to were often not the images that they were responding to. So it's, it's re-educated my way of looking at those collections and has given me some, some more kinds of insights into the things that our audiences want to see, want to engage with, and the ways that they want to engage with them. Um, so for some of the images, it was purely about fashion. And I usually work with criminal collections and I suppose it's made me think, well, how can we bring out more of the, the collections that might interest people who are really into the fashions of the 50s or the 40s or the 80s? Um, how can we service that curiosity um, in, those, in those people? So it, it has reframed the way that I view some of those collections. And we've only got a few minutes left, but um, I think we might take one last question. And it is um, One Word Wednesdays it was a real gift for sanity during these times. Was it being a salve for mental health something you thought it might be? That's a wonderful question. So thank you very much for that one. As I mentioned earlier, the conception or that the project was conceived prior to any of us knowing about COVID-19. But it was conceived in a way that kind of was based on this idea of investment theory. And I wanted a way where people um, could contribute more than just clicking a, pressing a key to say like or, or an emoji. Um, and I wanted a way where people had to give a little bit more. They had, to, they had to invest a little bit more of themselves into making a response and engaging. And by doing so, 
you know, really committing in a way to having a stake in the project. So that was the thinking there. It became um, something greater when um, our circumstances changed and it became something, I think, that this sense of community and this sense of conversation and this, this regularity of it, I suppose, happening um, on Wednesdays and on Saturdays became something, um, I think, that did really uh, provide a framework or a structure for many people uh, in times when they were perhaps feeling isolated. Um, so it was about getting the brain working uh, in a cerebral way um, in terms of thinking about a one word response, but also um, this idea of a connected community uh, through this project. So I think that was inc an incredibly important um, uh, part of the project. Um, and it would have been, but more so with um, our current uh, situation in the, in the last six months. Yeah. And certainly for me, um, I want people coming to visit our sites and museums or use our collections or go online to actually um, have an experience where they they gain some intimate intellectual stimulation where you know they might have an emotional response to what they're seeing um, where they can just take a break from the day to day and have a moment where it's about thinking about something outside of their their everyday existence and that our museums exhibitions publications and all of the other things we do actually give people a sort of breather a moment to think about something that's a little bit different that sort of enchants them or you know disturbs them or takes them on a slightly different journey they're stepping outside of their lives and that's one of the goals that um, we often have when we're putting together stuff in in the museums you know what you know what's what's this going to satisfy in our in our audience what what are the members of the public going to experience and how is that going to enrich their lives because it's about enriching people's lives that's that's part of what we we aim to do um, in the museum industry thanks Nerida so it's our time is almost up um, so before we go here are a few ways that you can get involved at a, as a citizen historian We'd love you to come along and see the exhibition while it's on at the Museum of Sydney and you can book tickets on the SLM website. The website address is slm.is forward slash ATW. Be on the lookout for hashtag caption this and hashtag one word campaigns that are online via the New South Wales State Archive social media channels. If you're a jigsaw fanatic, we have something very special for you. We have our wonderful uh, Manor the dog, the clairvoyant dog, available for pre-order, and you can find the link on the SLM website. I've just been so delighted with the show, um, and it's been a great opportunity to present this uh, virtual curator's talk to our audiences tonight. So thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to staying in touch with you both through our virtual talks and once things get back to normal, if they get back to normal, our in-person curators talks. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Nerida. Thank you to our tech team. That's really been wonderful. And good evening, everybody. Good night. <laughs>